Okay. All right, I will. I can do that. Um, so, uh, quickly, the last kind of philosophical to, I think we're at the fulcrum point in the, the workshop where we go from the big picture to some more specific examples, and I think that's what we're going to do in the next few minutes here. Um, so, this is, we'll start definitely, again, more big picture, um, where we have come from from deep origins of observing climate um, as a people, and kind of what are some of the pathways where we go from observation to an understood need from somebody out there in the world to developing data sets that begin to put numbers on those observations to um, developing products and cultivating services both uh, you know, basically out in the field that help meet some of those stated needs. So hopefully if we're doing our job, we'll touch a little bit on all of that. Again, we won't hit frost and freeze specifics really hard in this presentation, um, but this is a background or hopefully that can inform the rest of the workshop. Um, so uh, we're from, the, I'm representing the climate monitoring branch which has the privilege of representing uh, much and, and if not all of NCDC on a regular basis through a series of products and reports that are developed. Um, we use the word the terms upstream and downstream quite a bit. That's basically how the data flows through the building. So the monitoring branch is responsible for basically providing regular updates to what is going on with the state of the physical climate system. But we are truly the tip of the, I don't know if it's the spear, the tip of something uh, that uh, represents the origins of data, even many decades ago, and observations taken to good scientific work and data set cultivation through the Weather Service and NCDC, and then ultimately um, one expression of that data in kind of the big circle of life of climate data is a monitoring uh, application as well. Um, so before we uh, try to address how climate data matters, you know, maybe we should ask, you, does climate matter? Um, and this is just a historical perspective from some sources. So I won't read this word for word, but this is a publication from 1959 um, where someone says, you know, I noticed once they removed the trees um, that the uh, Canary Islands, um, basically the climate changed dramatically there. And this is one of the first statements on land use change and its effect on local climate anyway. Um, and the thing is, it wasn't really written in 1959, it was actually uh, written in 1494. This is actually an observation by Christopher Columbus um, that was made. Um, so, you know, in the course of kind of trekking across the Atlantic a few times, he noticed that the Canary Island, even in, in his lifetime, had seen a change. So that is the beginning, you know, that's a pretty comprehensive and 600-year-old uh, observation of, I'm sorry, 500. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want people in climate that can't subtract? I don't know. That 500-year-old uh, observation of, of something he noticed that was important. Um, you know, the, the weather changed in this particular place, and he tried to attribute why, but he made that observation. So another couple in that spirit. Um, in the Odyssey, um, basically Homer, you know, every single place that's described in the Iliad and the Odyssey, he begins with this kind of climate description. The winds are out of a certain direction, and the rains come at this time of year, and the ocean is angry or it's not. And so these are also climate observations um, from hundreds to thousands of years ago. And he basically says, you know, when he's talking about a character, um, that heaven is heaven because there's a westerly wind there. Um, so even at the time that this was written, it was known that, at least in the Mediterranean, a westerly wind was a good thing. And that means people had taken the time to notice that. Um, so climate was important to them, and they had taken the time to notice that enough times that it could be passed through the wisdom of generations that, hey, around here, westerly wind feels like that. So, um, and uh, also long ago, uh, pick your testament. We've got both of them represented here. Um, basically, you know, an observation from the New Testament uh, when you see the wind coming from a certain direction, you can expect a certain type of weather. Um, and in the Old Testament, uh, the east winds brought the locusts. So, um, you know, all of these writings represented at the time pretty much 
everything that everyone knew about the world. And um, there was some attention given to climate and how changes in the climate system, even if they're day-to-day -day weather changes, tended to affect people in profound ways. So that's kind of the origins. Um, it's very deep and philosophical. It doesn't connect directly to, um, well, it does direct connectly to today's data, but there has always been a drive to better understand the role that weather and climate um, play in our lives. And, uh, and it's expressed here. And so what the step was from these writings, which are kind of the collected wisdom and observations of people at the time, is there was a drive to put numbers on these things and to understand them and to quantify them with mathematics and statistics. And that's where data comes in. Um, so where, uh, where data maybe was my uncle told me uh, about this previously, now data is attached to numbers that were taken. And we can better quantify and specify and people can leverage this data that's been very specific to, pro to profit from their decisions, whether it's profit with a capital P or profit um, on a personal level as well. Anyway, so that's the, the philosophical sales pitch. So a few uh, notes before we start. Um, we're going to talk about the state of the climate now, some of the data sets that we're using to examine that and what's going on. And a big theme in the last couple of years has been extreme weather and climate. So how has the rash of really crazy weather uh, events, how does that relate to what we know about our climate and, and what we know about our changing climate? And before we do that, you know, weather is complex, and the weather and climate together is really complex, and crazy weather and climate, that intersection is exceedingly complex, and science is conservative. So a lot of the um, findings that are produced through climate science using climate data are really the most confident of a whole collection of intuitions about the relationship between weather and climate and what establishes that confidence is data. Um, so um, it's nice to work in, um, in a field and in a building where, you know, we're helping to uh, help people sort out these relationships. And we'll go into this. Okay, so that's it. This is a, a pictorial way of saying the same thing. The climate is big. It's got a lot of moving parts. And understanding how they um, relate to each other is a huge challenge for a board of uh, scientists and people in industry, and data helps make some of these relationships uh, come to life. All right, so uh, just really quick, and we'll go uh, fairly quick through this. Um, we'll talk about the current and recent state of the climate, some of the data sets we used to analyze. We'll focus a little bit on frost and freeze events, um, and then we'll talk about um, the general relationship between what extreme weather and climate, and then time permitting, we'll uh, talk about specific types of extreme weather, um, if that's okay. All right, so a lot of this, basically the, the, the guts of this content come from um, the BAM State of Climate Report, which is over here, which is an annual snapshot of what's going on with the climate system, which brings about 400 authors together from about 50 countries around the world to um, write what they know about glaciers or sea surface salinity or land surface temperature or lake, uh, lake uh, temperature and so on. So um, that's, that's the physical, the annual physical, basically the numbers associated with the physical of the climate system. So when you go get your annual physical, they take more than your temperature, take your blood pressure, um, they take the pulse, they do an EKG. This is the full physical of the climate system each year. Um, the climate assessment report um, builds on this, which is just observational in nature and provides a connection to the science. So why are these things happening the way they are? How is the country prepared um, to uh, accommodate these types of changes? That's what the assessment report does. An extreme weather paper that was published just last year um, with a couple dozen authors that tried to capture the state of the knowledge on the relationship between um, climate and extreme weather and how these things are changing. And then some of the data comes from our, our monitoring branch here in, in CDC. Some of the products, I'm sorry, not the data. The data comes from everywhere. Some of the products came from the climate monitoring uh, branch. So where are we now? Um, just from starting with a big global picture, each one of these blue crosshairs is the global average surface temperature since 1880. And uh, 
The blue crosshair below the zero line means that that year was cooler than the 20th century average, and the green, the blue crosshair above the zero line means that particular year was warmer than the 20th century average, and um, the pink or red decadal averages represent the average of the 10 blue crosshairs that make up that decade. And so with a lot of data, including frost and freeze events, you're going to see a hierarchy of noise in the, in the data. So an example here in the global temperature data is we see some year-to-year -year variability. We see a pretty clear long-term trend. Um, we see uh, basic uh, a trend of moving out of this neighborhood from the early 20th century into a new neighborhood in the middle 20th century and rapidly into a different neighborhood in the late 20th century and the last few years as well. But we also see that it doesn't happen monotonically. There's a lot of up and down, a lot of bouncing around. When we think about frost and freeze events, really, really similar. Um, one year to the next, we will see, and especially with something especially as you get further south where they become rarer and rarer in much of the season, you'll see a lot of noise bouncing around. And part of the analysis and usefulness of understanding frost and freeze events is doing stuff like, well, let's not try to follow each blue crosshair with our eyeballs. Let's aggregate them into something a little larger where we can understand a clear trend recognizing that there's a lot of noise in there um, as well. So that's an example from a really obvious global temperature standpoint that it has applications. Um, a lot of this, and, and the normals um, effort as well that Anthony will get into, is a lot about understanding how to capture variability without becoming completely obliterated by variability. Is that fair? Okay. All right. Um, so there is data that, that behind all of these assertions. So it's not just temperature that indicates a warming world. Um, this is one of the things that we do is try to understand how the system is changing. So if you pulled uh, air temperature out and you looked at these 11 other indicators, they are all consistent with what we would understand would happen in a warming world. And that would be a lot of stuff is going up related to heat content and temperature and sea level. And basically, the frozen stuff is getting smaller. So. Um, this is, uh, from a data center and an assessment perspective, a way of looking at an issue from multiple directions, knowing that there are inherent uh, limitations to any one single data set. And I assume frost and freeze needs are the same way. Some people can tolerate a certain amount of, uh, of uh, variability in a data set. Some people want the cleanest possible. So multiple perspectives usually help with, with multiple needs. Um, Another way that we can characterize data other than a time series, which is what we looked at the first time, is saying, OK, well, this is what that last crosshair on that graph, that 2012 crosshair, when you spread that out on a map, this is what it looks like. It wasn't equally warm around the planet. Um, that blue crosshair is actually an average of a lot of regional patterns. And so while we were really, really warm in North America in 2012, most of the rest of the world was just kind of too really warm. And then parts of the world were actually cooler than average. And this is what we see um, you know, typically every year in global surface temperature. And it applies, again, to frost and freeze events. They're regional in nature. Um, not all areas that you're interested in are affected the exact same way from year to year. There is a lot of regional and spatial noise uh, in there as well. Um, and then another way we look at uh, Math is to plot trends. What is the trend? How is this phenomenon changing over time? So this happens to be a map of um, the trend in surface, annual surface temperature from 1880 through 2012. Each grid point um, is associated with a certain magnitude of change. Most of the world is getting warmer over that time. And we can cut that up into subsections as well. So the next slide shows since 1970. And we can see, compared to the long-term trend, much of the world is warming faster. And um, again, another way to think about frost and freeze data, uh, in certain sectors, people are concerned not so much, well, they are concerned about what just happened. But there's a lot of planning involved. And where is this going? And can we extrapolate a straight line? So. We have a question. Can you put back the previous chart? 
And again, back to the uh, so, so oh. comparison of the two school pictures. Yes. So the gray in the middle of the African continent, does that suggest that there was data available for that when yes. mm -hmm. that when we did it on the next slide? Yeah, so more data of it. The, the period since 1970 is more filled with data, or filled enough with data to make an assessment for this part, but it was when we go back to the late 1800s, it's not. And you can see we've filled in a lot of the map. Oh, yeah. Another feature also related to frost and freeze data depends on um, the data in there. So um, going to the U.S. with the time series, just to um, validate what we all experienced in the last year, this is a, I call this the Catholic school, grade school picture, where you line up from the shortest kid on the left to the tallest kid on the right. And I was usually right here. Yeah, somewhere in there. But this is the coolest year in U.S. history to the warmest year in U.S. history um, for the 118 or so years that we have on record. And these are the five coolest years that we've observed and the years that they occurred. And then before this year, or this last year, these were the four warmest. And then when you throw 2000, these were the other 108 years in our record, and uh, 2012 was kind of an outlier. Um, it was an amazingly warm year uh, when you line them up this way. Um, even outside the context, the U.S. is getting warmer, but even outside that context, this was a special year in that regard. It was very uh, phenomenally, off, you know, literally off the, the chart. We had to put the 55 line on here. So. Anyway, that's what we experienced across the contiguous U.S. Um, that again, just like frost and freeze data, spreads out into a regional pattern. So we saw, and we'll explore this as well, you know, most of the states were the warmest on record or the very close to it. So the 118 means warmest out of 118 years on record. 117 means second warmest out of 118 years on record. Uh, statistical kind of ranking uh, technique. Um, but most of the states were really warm. We also had a drop going on in much of the Midwest and the Plains that emerged in the summer. So Nebraska was the big winner having the driest year in its history, along with having the warmest year in its history. Um, again, taking two pieces of information that are measured in different ways, that are kind of related in the climate system, but helping to characterize a broader pattern of what was going on in parts of the world. We'll talk about these impacts in a set. Um, this is the list of states that had their warmest or coolest or wettest or driest something in the last three years. It's a pretty phenomenal list. So the red, the red states had their warmest, uh, for this example, March, that was their warmest March on record, or maybe they had their warmest spring on record. And it's been a busy year in the monitoring world keeping up with this. We've, um, the last few years have been quite extreme, even on this state-by-state state level. Um, anyway, so, and then another thing we track, combining data um, with, with, with the real life out there in the states is um, uh, disasters whose direct damages um, affect uh, or amount to more than a billion dollars. The last couple of years have been really big in this regard as well. So some of the issues and some of the folks, especially in industry, are balancing that um, relationship between the physical climate system and what people own and where they own it and what they do with it. And an example of it, a data product that, tends to, that tries to marry the extreme behavior of the climate system in the context of some of these big extreme events happened to happen where people owned a lot of stuff um, and, and there were a lot of people that lived there. That's another uh, example of uh, ways to marry the physical climate data with what we know about um, how, we, how we live. Um, we all know about Hurricane Sandy all just flow right through that. Um, one of the interesting and unique things we do in the monitoring branch is validate national and statewide extremes. Um, so I actually have a plaster cast of this in my office. This was the biggest hailstone ever recorded in North America. Um, so it's not just data that is observed by instruments that were designed to observe data. There is also observational things that we find kind of data um, being constructed here. Obviously, 
this is obviously not the largest hailstone that's ever fallen in North America, but this is the largest hailstone that's ever been picked up and talked about in North America. So the strange thing about this is we had four stones in this same year that would have broken the national record. It was a really big uh, hailstone year in 2010. So. Um, so, so getting to some real data and some real frost and freeze stuff. Um, this is a commonly called a Haywood plot of temperature in Muskegon, Michigan, um, which is in west central Michigan. And from left to right, what's happening with each one of these lines represents a different year in Muskegon's history. So this is a hundred and some odd years that Muskegon. And it's the average temperature from January 1st on the left through that date. And so it's really noisy at first because there's very few days. And um, they, as you settle in and you build more and more, they add more and more days onto the year-to-date average. This is kind of how history evolved at Muskegon, Michigan. There's faintly visible a dark gray line. That's the normal um, at the year-to-date temperature in Muskegon. We colored the five ultimately coolest years in blue. We colored the five ultimately warmest years in red. And then this is 2012. So this is what they experienced in March of 2012. Um, unprecedented warmth for March in much of the country. Muskegon in particular, highs in the 80s, lows in the 60s. That's like May, uh, June type weather. So that pulled this year-to-date average up uh, for Muskegon. But then what happened uh, shortly after? Um, so we saw a lot of ag and hort emergence, uh, particularly non-native species, and that means planted crops, uh, stuff that is grown for profit in the Midwest, greened up. Um, so during this time, a lot of orchard crops, a lot of ag, a lot of port interests, a lot of um, managed species in the Midwest greened up. And then we saw freeze, 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 uh, four nights in Muskegon, um, you know, a week, a month after that. And we saw a lot of agricultural losses based on the combination of not just the freeze, but the freeze in the context with all the green things getting us six week head start on greening up. So uh, again, frost and freeze data back in a prior life when I was young and skinny, we used to uh, look at degree days and their relationship from when you really got vulnerable for different crops. Um, and so there's a relationship there um, between this warmth that piled up and this economic damage to happen. This happens in a cold year, everyone's okay. This happens in a warm year, we saw some severe damage in the Midwest. Um, so at the time we have left, which is 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. We'll look at some of the findings from that extreme weather and climate paper and uh, talk about philosophically how they're related and then hit some specific hazards and how they're related and how they're known to be evolving over time. Um, so just quickly, weather and climate, we'll, we'll go through several metaphors for the relationship between weather and climate. And one is um, the stock market, the long-term trend is measured by the Dow Jones Index and some of the things that happen. And we can see that the long-term trend is up, but we had specific events that drove the stock market up and down in a particular direction. And um, weather and climate kind of are nestled the same way. You know, of course, uh, we have this long-term climate signal that, that a lot of people are interested in. We have a short-term weather signal that a lot of people are interested in. They are related, but um, climate doesn't necessarily drive weather. It's basically composed of, of the weather that occurs. And we'll get into better examples like right now. So the only piece of literature to review for homework from this uh, presentation is a, a document that was written by Stallone and others in 1976 that completely characterizes the relationship between weather and climate. So uh, this is the one. Um, and this is weather. And this is climate. And the relationship there is kind of weather throws the punches, but climate trains the boxer. And when you change the trainer, 
you will change the overall composition of the punches that are thrown. You may throw certain punches more often, certain punches less often, certain punches more effectively, certain punches less effectively. Um, you still don't know what he's going to do with one minute and 12 seconds left in the seventh round of his next fight. But you do know, if you watch him for a while, he's going to throw a lot more left hooks if this guy's his trainer. And that's the relationship between weather and climate. And that's what a lot of the research is trying to capture, is how can we characterize this influence on this behavior? And the core of that, again, is data. Data is what helps us become confident and quantifiable in defining those relationships. So one example, one product, we have a product um, to explain it would, would take a long time. Um, but this is basically a metric of, it's our, our one, of, one component of our climate extremes index. And what it tries to represent is how much of the contiguous United States experienced what we categorize as extreme here, which is the uppermost 10%, um, minimum temperature, maximum temperatures during the summer. So from 1910 on the left, through last summer, how much of the country was experiencing extreme minimum to maximum temperatures over that period? And you can see in the last few decades some spikes in how much of the U.S. was experiencing really warm temperatures versus really cool temperatures. And you could go through the exercise of finding the weather events that drove these. And you could say, well, this event was weather, and this one was weather, and there was a big ridge that set up here, and we had a blocking pattern here, and that was weather, and this is weather, and you'd be, you'd be correct. You could also look at that and say, yeah, but you know that 30-year period, that's the influence of climate. And that, again, is the relationship between trying to capture, capture that important thing. Interestingly, minimum temperature is actually more dramatic. So um, one thing that we're seeing, and I know this is totally different than frost and freeze information, but more and more of the country is being subjected to extremely warm minimum morning temperatures uh, during the summer. And from a real impact, that's hard on crops, that's hard on horticulture, that's hard on livestock, that's hard on human systems, particularly people that can't afford air conditioning, which is hard on public health. Um, so there are clear relationships between what we're seeing in much of the U.S. and what we're managing and, and dealing with. Um, another few things that we try to capture in the relationship, it's not all just climate change that's affecting what we're seeing. There's a lot of seasonal variability, and one of the um, patterns that, that particularly seasonal forecasters look at is INSO, or the role of El Nino and La Nina, which has a significant influence on how seasons play out in the U.S. Um, we won't go into the details. The Arctic Oscillation is another one of these teleconnections that help um, provide some predictability in the next few weeks of are we going to be more prone to seeing big cold air outbreaks? Um, are we going to be less prone? So actually this Arctic Oscillation has really driven a lot of the very, very recent cold outbreaks. I wouldn't say driven it is related to a lot of the big cold air outbreaks that we've seen lately. So this is how we go from kind of measuring the climate. This was the outcome. This was one of a stew of drivers, but a pretty important one. And then the data helps us define the relationships between what we see in this arctic oscillation pattern and what people experience most of the time uh, in their homes. Um, so finally, the last metaphor. Um, I have a 10-year-old son, so uh, here's one last climate and weather metaphor. Uh, so my kid is kind of impulsive. Uh, he has a short attention span. I think that's safe. Um, he's really sensitive to his environment. Um, and he's prone to occasional extreme behavior if the right ingredients come together. Now, if you ever raised a 10-year-old boy, maybe you know what I'm talking about. So, um, so and the good thing about him is he moves on really quickly. So we're going to name that kid weather. Um, that's, that's characteristic of, of weather. Um, and he's, even in a very stable environment, uh, an unchanging environment, he is prone to these kind of fits um, where he, the ingredients kind of get wrong and he goes off the rails. 
and that's the relationship even between a stable climate and um, extreme weather. Um, so what happens if we change the climate uh, that he grows up in? So um, we may see some things if we change the overall climate that he's experiencing. And, you know, he's still impulsive. He's still mostly concerned with what's immediately around him, which is weather. That's what weather responds. Um, he still spends months at a time hanging out with influential friends. Um, uh, but he seems to be getting into strange sets of ingredients more often. Um, the drivers of his days are staying. In a weather context, it's the position of the jet stream and the location of moisture and the amount of instability. So the drivers of his days are sense, but the trajectory of his life has changed. And again, that's the last metaphor that I can think of that explains this coach, athlete, parent, child, um, kind of relationship between weather and climate. And a lot of extreme weather is not, it is about the, the change in composition of the ingredients coming together. We are probably close to out of time, so we'll leave it, leave it right there. Um, we still can't predict the outcome eight months from now, but we can notice trends. And here's where it's, it's, it's interesting in this climate change being such a charged topic is because um, parenting gets blamed for everything, so does climate change. Um, you know, sometimes it's just weather, um, but it's hard to separate which events. And so we really say things, you know, if my kid grows up, runs a red light, causes a crash, oh, it's bad parenting. That's easy to say, but it's also, hey, maybe he was in a hurry. Maybe he was hungry, maybe he was texting while driving. I don't know. You know, there may be some immediate local factors, or it could be crummy parenting, you never know. So the relationship between climate and weather is like trying to sort up sort that out. Um, which is challenging. And it requires data to help get there. So that's it for me. Thank you very much, Zeke. Um, I have